the first presentation from Mackenzie Mathis. Uh, Mackenzie uh, became an assistant professor and Bertarelli founder, Foundation Chair of Integrative Neuroscience at EPFL in Switzerland, where she uh, recently relocated from Harvard University, where she was a Rowland Fellow. Uh, prior to starting her lab, she completed her PhD studies at Harvard, studying the neural circuits and mechanisms underlying sensory motor learning, and a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Tübingen, where she started working on animal pose estimation research. Uh, and through that work, uh, as you're going to hear about, she uh, worked with her partner to develop deep lab cut. Uh, so McKinsey, if you could take over, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Justin. Um, it's really delighted to be here today and to get to highlight a bit of our tech for you. Um, so as, as Justin mentioned, I work on animal pose estimation, which might seem like a, a niche thing, but <laughs> I think for today, it's uh, kind of exciting to present to this group and hopefully inspire you to use some of these tools and open source tools in particular in your research program. So I'll go ahead and jump right in and then, um, yeah, so of course you all know that measuring movement has been a long-standing question and even from things like Edward Muybridge or David Marr trying to tell us about getting the gestalt of an animal through this sort of skeletonized version of them has really been impactful for studying animal motion and of course humans are animals. Um, and so for us in the in the laboratory setting or in you know movies and things like that, getting markers on humans is a very natural way to be able to digitize this information and collect these sort of key points to make these skeletons. But of course, many of the questions that you and I have uh, don't necessarily facilitate marker-based tracking and being able to non-invasively just be a video, extract these key points and get this information to effectively get a low dimensional embedding of motion over time is a really impactful way to potentially measure psychiatric diseases and of course, uh, motor diseases as well. Um, and so about five years ago, deep learning sort of burst onto the scene and made tremendous progress. So here's an example of a code called open pose. Um, these are humans arguably in the wild on the pier in Sydney. And you can see that each one of the individuals is nicely tracked and annotated through time. Um, this is quite an amazing feat and these deep neural networks have been really powerful to do this. And if you're sort of newer to the deep learning field, I mean, effectively it's, it works like this. You have an image in pixel space. You want to extract these um, key points and then you get out a pose once you kind of combine these key points together. The catch of course is that you need to be able to train these deep neural networks for this predictor and you typically need a lot of labeled data to do this. And so when we started into the field wanting to do this in a more um, you know, laboratory-based environment for lots of different animals, this was sort of a limitation that we saw that we wanted to overcome. Um, so I'm not going to go through, of course, all the science of this, but suffice it to say, we use a concept called transfer learning, and we're able to make deep neural networks that can be tailored specifically to your application with very low data input. So really, in an afternoon, you can label some frames, train this deep neural network, fine-tune it end to end and then be able to deploy it onto new animals that the network hasn't seen before. You can do this with very little training data. So on the left side of your screen, um, the red line of course is just these held out test images. And so we look at the network's performance compared to human ground truth annotations. And in this particular example, the RMSE or the pixel error was for a mouse tracking experiment where the width of the nose of the mouse was 10 pixels. So you can see already that anything below these 10 pixels is quite good performance. And so we're getting a uh, quite nice performance in around 50 frames of labeled data. And then as I mentioned, this can nicely generalize to other animals even. It's agnostic to the number of animals. So you really can use this as a really powerful platform for studying um, you know, both longitudinal behaviors, but also even potentially for clinical applications. And so once this sort of became um, that we saw the usefulness of this for people in general, we made, took a sort of software 2.0 approach to this. And instead of just giving you deep neural networks, uh, we made a full end-to-end -end pipeline that allows you to do project management, uh, clustering methods to extract maximally different frames, graphical user interfaces to label your data, to select networks, to train them, to evaluate them, to refine them, and of course, all the tools to run inference and extract this data, which then you can put into uh, many of the models and tools that have been discussed today. Um, so this has been deployed quite widely now. We've been around for about two years. We're rather young, and I should say we're an academic lab. This is fully open source and free for both academic and commercial use. 
Um, but you can go back to old data or new data or multi-animal situations now. And we just hit about 160,000 downloads. So we think this has been uh, nicely widely deployed uh, in science, which is exciting. And so we're really embedded in this open source ecosystem, both from taking insights from computer vision and built on their open source code and in our own development in academia. Of course, the Python stack, um, we have a lot of tools for you to be able to deploy this and iterate on the code yourself. Um, also large scale pipeline computing is of importance for many people. Neuroscience specifically, there's been lots of tools that have integrated deep lab cut into it. And then these post-processing tools to do things like classifiers on top to say, for example, in pain research, is an animal in pain or is it not in pain? Um, of course, you can use deep neural networks again to do more type of behavioral annotation. And then I list a few others that have come out in recent years, specifically that take the input um, from deep lab cut into these pipelines. Okay, but sort of from where the demo side today, what I wanted to tell you about is another vision that we have um, that I think might be of interest to this group, namely sharing data is really hard. And I think this has been touched on at several points today as I was listening to these amazing talks. Um, but sharing neural networks is a really attractive way to get the benefit of data sharing without actually having to share the data. So you can't reverse engineer and extract what training data went into these neural networks. And so the idea is that if we can make neural networks that we can share broadly with the community, whether that's in neuroscience applications or even for humans, then these are things that people can deploy and hopefully it makes more robust and usable tools. So we kind of cheekily call this the model zoo. Um, but if you go to this website, what you'll see is the different models that are already available. Uh, during our COVID times, we did a lot on cats and dogs. So maybe you have some at home and have some videos you wanna play with, but there's also of course humans and a lot of non-human primate model systems. So you can simply click on this link, which will send you to Google Colab. So you can use their GPUs for free. Um, it's a simple connect. And then you can deploy the code, namely just click through and upload a video when it asks you to. So you'll see on the right is uh, one user from Twitter who just tried this on their dog. Um, and I think they nicely showed on the input video and the output video that it works quite nicely, even though this dog, of course, was never in the training data set. Um, and so these models are also available for humans and non-human primates, as I mentioned. Another way that we're trying to make this even better is to do this in a sort of citizen science and community science driven approach. So we recently launched this app where if you want to give back, that'd be wonderful to label data that uh, we take images that have good licenses. And then we put these back into the training pool, we refine our networks and continue to give you the latest and greatest on the front of being able to deploy these networks overall. Um, yeah, so just as an example, of course, we get data like this. So this is a dog that's been labeled by multiple individuals. And then we can, of course, on the back end, kind of clean this up and find the right key points and then add this back into the training data set. So if you'd like to contribute, that'd be wonderful. But minimally, I hope you find the model zoo a nice, important uh, resource for as a starting point for research. Um, and another thing I should mention is in this pre-trained network platform that we have, it's not that you have to have all the exact same key points that you might want to use. So for example, um, you might wanna add some more key points for facial tracking or ignore some key points on the body of the human, but you still have this network that's seen a lot of different humans, for example. And so that can be a really nice starting point. Um, yeah, just wanted to highlight two resources if you're interested. So we recently wrote a current opinion piece about how we think uh, deep learning tools will really start to shape the field of research and animal behavior. And then a primer and neuron kind of getting into the nitty gritty details about the network architectures and how you optimize them if you're interested in some of the science. I have lots of people to thank in my laboratory and my funders, but um, if I have a few minutes left, I can also just kind of quickly show you a few other resources in sort of the tech domain. Okay. Great, all right, so this is on deeplabcut.org. And so here you'll find all the different tools to get started. Because of course this is, um, it is open source software. We're not a company, but we do really want to make sure that you kind of get the best um, user experience. So we have things like a question and answer forum, people chip in from the general uh, user community as well. We host workshops or we did, and now we have a full online course. And there's a lot of video tutorials to take you through um, the latest updates that are going on, how to use the graphical user interfaces, 
things like CoLab um, and some of the things that I highlighted for you here today. Um, here's the app again that I mentioned. And so here's just one image I wanted to share with you because one of the models we want to release is sort of a unified rodent tracker that can be used in research. Um, rodents are a really important model system and particularly for behavioral phenotyping and long scale studies. Uh, this could be a really important resource to be able to share and get really robust data from everyone that's sort of unbiased by maybe your just particular tailored solution. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, thanks. I'd be happy to take your questions if you have any and looking forward to the other amazing texts that uh, are up on the docket tonight. Or tonight for me in Geneva, I should say. <laughs> Good afternoon in Boston. <laughs> thanks so much.